Good morning. Happy, happy homecoming. Turn to someone and tell them happy homecoming. Go. I am super excited and I hope that you are too. It is homecoming. We are 164 years old today. Woo, we're young. Um, two exciting things are happening today. First, my favorite Dixie, Dixie Ford, will be speaking this morning for us. She's here with her family. They're just too cute. And then also, after the service, second most exciting thing, the Williams Buffet. It is the free buffet. It comes around once a year, and that is today. Do not miss out on the Williams Buffet. I rhymed. That's weird. I didn't mean to do that. I'm a poet. Okay, so everyone is invited. If you brought something or not, come right after the service to our CMC and enjoy the fellowship and the delicious food. Um, just know that tonight we will not have evening worship because of the nap that is needed after partaking in the Williams Buffet. So you may take your nap as long as you need this afternoon. Um, just know that there's some things going on this week. Wednesday, we have supper at 5.30. Then at 6 o'clock, youth will be going to the nursing home. Then at 6.30, we have Bible study and children's activities. And the menu is in the bulletin. If you look inside, you will see. That all starts at 5.30. And also, Mike Duncan wanted me to announce that the Callaway Garden trip deadline will also be Wednesday by noon, so you need to let him know that you're going by noon on Wednesday. And then one last thing, Brotherhood Breakfast will be this Saturday in the CMC at 7 o'clock in the morning, okay? All right, and there's some other things that are going on, so make sure that you read the bulletin front and back, okay? So now, there's some folks here that I haven't seen in a while, and you haven't seen in a while. So find them, grab their neck, and squeeze tight, okay? Give some kisses on some cheeks. Let's go. The Lord be with you. See, I'm not preaching later, so I went ahead and did that now. I thought I'd go ahead and do it. Oh, th and that's the third exciting thing Nikki didn't tell you is I'm not preaching today. <laughs> so you all are get able to stay awake. And uh, just it's go so good to be here with you for worship this morning. 164 years. Any of you been here for most of them? <laughs> Some of you probably feel like you've been here. <laughs> feel like you've been here for most of them, but it, it is a testament to the faithfulness of this church and this community to say that we can gather and celebrate our 164th year and know that in many ways some of our best years are still ahead of us. And so it is so good to be with you here for worship. And as we have gathered, I want to just sort of introduce someone to you. Most of you probably already know Dixie Ford, our speaker, our preacher this morning. Uh, Dixie is currently the Minister of Worship and Families at Cross Creek Baptist Church in Pelham, right? Birmingham, Pelham. They're starting to just become the same place, really. And so, uh, Dixie, we're glad that you be here, and we're glad you brought Scott with you. Scott was uh, our youth minister here some time ago. Not too long ago, right, Scott? It's not been that long. Yeah, and um, 
And they brought their kids, Allie, Amber, Thomas, and Anna with them. And uh, just, we look forward to what you have to say to us this morning, what God is going to speak through you, Dixie. So thank you for being here, Scott. Thanks for being here. And you guys are welcome to stay for lunch if you want. So, um, But as we have gathered here together this day for the worship of God on this special day, our 164th homecoming, let us join our hearts together as we begin our time with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful, Lord, that you have allowed this community, this worshiping community, to continue on for these 164 years. God, we are thankful for all the ways that you've blessed this church, all the ways that you've used this church to bless others and to spread the good news of your kingdom across this world. And Lord, we ask that you be with us now in this time of worship. God, give us voices to sing your praise. Give us ears to hear, hearts that are open to receive what you have for us, and hands and feet, Lord, that will do the things you call us to do, that we may continue to be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our scripture call to worship today is 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 585. Brethren, we have met to worship. I ask that you stand with us if we sing uh, both stanzas of this. Thank you. 
choose the weapon, tell you the news, the Lord has loved you all along. So you're asking again, well, the doubts have never been, and simply trust him and it's over yourself. Singing, can you go to Woody? Yes, I can you go to Woody? You did. Can you take me? Could you take me? The History Committee decided to focus this morning on our church's international history for our history moment because in the year 2014, we've had some memorable events uh, with international missions. We sent a, a mission team this year of 18 individuals to the country of Haiti. Uh, the team worked very hard to provide both spiritual and physical assistance during their time in Haiti. The church family participated by helping to provide supplies that would help the missionaries meet some of the great needs of this impoverished country. And we're thankful for those that volunteered for that uh, big project. Previously, we've had a great number of young people participate in global missions, uh, which have included youth of our church, JSU students, and our adults as well. Their mission work included visiting many states throughout the USA, plus work in Canada, Russia, Japan, Bangladesh, France, Peru, Cuba, and the Ukraine. In reviewing our very own church book uh, written about the First Baptist Church of Williams, we found that the first time the word missions is mentioned is in July 1916, 98 years ago. The entry in the minutes reads as follows. The treasurer reported that the church received $94.92, of which $80 has been paid to the pastor. That's a lot of money, <laughs> percentage-wise, <laughs> with a remaining balance of $14, which was used for missions. The mission project is not mentioned, but the minutes tell us that mission work played a key role in the early ministry of our church. In February of 1930, moving forward a few years, the minutes state that the church adopted a plan of a monthly offering to the Baptist Cooperative Program. It appeared from the minutes that funds were difficult to come by in the 1920s and 30s, as you might think, and one report states that a committee of women was appointed to get up some money for missions. Also in the minutes was a report that a budget was arranged to meet expenditures for the church. And this is quite likely the first official budget that the church had, and it's dated November the 13th, 1949. And it reads as follows. Pastor and help, $300. Caretaker, $24. Children home ministry, $25. Missions, an additional $25. Electricity, $16. Fuel, $20. And flowers, $30. For a total that year, $440 but a significant uh, more amount of this being put towards uh, missions. Later, a budget was adopted in September of 1960, and it totaled $4,000. The offerings for cooperative program was 200, and the associational missions was 60. It's a blessing to know that mission giving has continually increased throughout the years. The number of mission causes the church has helped with and assisted with is really astounding. In 1995, Vic Jacobson of New Hope Ministries, one of our mission causes, presented a challenge to the church family to assist in building a church for some Christians in the Ukraine who were struggling to find a place to worship, an idea hard for us to imagine. Within a short period of time, we collected $13,554, exceeding the lofty goal of $13,000 that Reverend Jacobson had presented. 
The church was built, and it is still located in Korsum, Ukraine. In May of 1997, Dr. Paige Fulgham, a representative of Mercer School of Theology, was the guest speaker in this building for one of our services. First Baptist Church of Williams voted to become a founding church in support of the McAfee School of Theology in Atlanta, Georgia. This support will reduce costs for any of our members who may want to attend from here, as well as provide assistance to others wishing to attend. Scott and Dixie Ford and Michael Duncan are graduates of McAfee. The year 1999 was entitled the Year of Missions. During the church, the Year of the Church enjoyed assisting a number of missions, including World Aid, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, the Alabama Cooperative Baptist Fellowship, International Mission Board, New Hope, New Tribes, JCOC, BCM, and at JSU, our Father's Arms Ministry, and a new ministry to which Chris Messer was added to, he served at called Dent Aid USA. Today, November the 2nd, 2014, we celebrate our 164th homecoming event. As we consider the mission efforts that we support at the present time, it is meaningful that First Baptist Church of Williams still wholeheartedly supports mission. The current budget allocates the following, World Mission $7,000, Cooperative Program JSU $1,500, Cooperative Baptist Fellowship $21,200, Local Missions $13,000, for a total of $42,700 in missions. We look back at our beginning as a church and see the people who came before us. They helped establish this church in 1850, and they had great expectations for the work of the Lord at his church at Williams. Through the years, that work has been entrusted to us now, the succeeding generation. just take a moment real quick um, the song I'm doing today wasn't a scheduled song I, I spent all week um, jamming out in my car and we usually have a, a good bit of time um, in Atlanta between seven and nine and four and seven you know to, to, to sing uh, while you sit still on your ride home um, so I'm sure a lot of folks in Atlanta enjoyed um, my, my, my practices along the way um, I, I went back and forth. This song, I, I picked this song up uh, many years ago. Uh, I've never sang it. Uh, I've always liked it. Um, but it made me think of Williams, you know, because, I mean, Williams is home to me. And, you know, I've got a long ways to go on my journey as a Christian. I'm certainly not perfect. I um, certainly have a, a lot of things to work on, uh, a lot of growth, as, as I think we all do. Um, but Williams was a, is a place that, you know, that I hold really dear to my heart. You know, it's a place that family still lives in, um, but uh, that a lot of people was kind of that foundation. You know, we, we, we celebrated this week one of those um, people that really is why I'm standing up here today because I would have never had the, uh, the courage to do so without any of the Barker family. Um, but uh, this song I picked up not too far, too long after my granddaddy passed and uh, you know, then a lot of others just kind of started falling behind them. And I realized just how, you know, what a monumental um, development those people are. Because no matter what, you know, the, no matter, although I may not think about it every day, there's always some part that makes me think of Williams. I was thinking this morning, I don't think the kids do it anymore. But, you know, when the old school building was right out here, we, we always had Sunday afternoon football games. There was us, my little group, you know, Kel, Brad. Then there was the big guys. All of those, you know, Tyler and those, and all those names that nobody can remember. Hambone, all those, I mean, but <coughs> we made a decision that it was a great idea as 13-year-old, 14-year-olds to join in their game one day. I believe that was the last time we ever played with those guys because I don't think they could, they, they could not play in the NFL today with all the targeting rules and the, and the, and the head, head-to-head -head contact, and this was without pads, so... If you, if you could survive at Williams on a Sunday afternoon, you, you were tough. Uh, but all of that, when you look back, it just, you know, it, it's all what builds you. It's the family around you that builds what you are, you know, to eventually overcome all of the challenges that you face. And you face a lot of them. So I say that because this song, I, I sat here and I, I, I put Sarah through my other song on the way over here. And Lena, she slept. Um, and I went back and forth on this song. I thought it would be good. I've never sang it. It's just always ridden in the truck with me. 
But I got up here and started practicing my other song that I worked so hard on, and every time we got to a part, it just started skipping. So I'd look at Mike. I was like, Mike, it's number four. Let's go. Let's get this right. And eventually we just decided it was, uh, it's not going to be today. So there was a, uh, I guess, a small hand that just kind of said, no, I don't want you to do this song today. I want you to do this song because it speaks of, you know, friends and loved ones and people that, you know, that have been a part of your life and develop who you are. And I think it's more than just people. It's, it's this church. Um, and when you step away from this church, we're in a new church now. And, you know, trying to build those same relationships in our, in our church uh, where we're at now, it's just... It's always good to come home for homecoming. There are places I remember all my life, though some have changed. Some forever and not for better. Some are lost and some remain. All these places have their moments with people and friends. I still can recall some are dead and some are living. But in my life, I love them all. But of all these friends and loved ones, there is no one compares with you. And as memories lose their meaning, when I think of love, as something new though I know I'll never lose affection for people and friends that went before I know I'll often stop and think about them but in my life I loved you Soon will come to the end of life's journey. And perhaps we'll never meet anymore till we gather in heaven's bright city far away on that beautiful shore if we never meet again this side of heaven as we struggle through this world and its strife there's another Somewhere in heaven By the beautiful river of life Where the charming roses bloom forever Separations come no more if we never meet again this side of heaven i will meet you on that beautiful shore Thank you, Ryan, for that song and for the memories that brings back to some of us. <clears throat> our next hymn this morning is hymn number 284. Uh, they'll know Christians by our love. We'll sing the first, second, and four stanzas. I ask that you sing as we stand. Stand as you sing with us. <laughs> 
Sing as you stand with us and stand as you sing with us.
Let me just uh, first of all say thank you for inviting my family to come and worship and fellowship with you today. It is good to be here. We love, we consider it a blessing and a privilege to get to come back to Williams anytime we can. We don't get back here often enough, but you all are always in our hearts. This is a, a special place for us. Scott was youth minister here back when we were practically youth ourselves, and we were married here over 18 years ago, which is crazy. God led us to Williams at a pivotal time in our lives when we were becoming adults and right before the roller coaster of seminary years began. I came here barely in my 20s with a pretty small worldview and this congregation very graciously and gently pushed me into reading scripture in new ways and realizing the unlimited possibilities I had as a woman in ministry and I am forever thankful for that. We treasure the time that we spent here. It is good to see your faces. And of course, there's one face in particular that I'm missing today. I will not forget Roy's kindness to me when I was very scared and had no confidence and he invited me to lead the choir more than once and let me know that he believed in me. I don't think it was a big deal for him. That's just who he was, but it made a difference to me. And for Roy and for all of you, Scott and I are deeply grateful. Now, I have to admit that one of the reasons I have been so excited about being here on this particular day might have a little to do with the Williams Buffet. <laughs> I've been looking forward to it since Chris invited me to preach back in February or March, a long time ago. It's a long time to look forward to lunch. <laughs> this is a really good time to have a homecoming meal, too. It's November. It's officially the kickoff of pig out season, right? I mean, so from now through December 31st, we're supposed to eat as much as we possibly can and pack it on so that on New Year's Day, we're ready for a restart. Isn't that right? That's how it is at my house. So today, as we enter this holiday season and begin wrapping up another year, I want to invite you to imagine with me. Imagine that rather than entering the feast-filled holiday season, it's January 1st, and you have started a brand new diet. You're really feeling the weeks of holiday eating that started back with that church meal. And you're ready for a new beginning. You're inspired. And you know this time it's going to work. This is going to be the year that you shed those extra pounds and get in the best shape of your life. And six months down the road, when it's summertime, you will be the next Jillian Michaels. The day is going well. It's still January 1st. You're feeling strong and you are able to resist every temptation even the homemade fudge from last night's New Year's Eve party, not a temptation for you. You laugh in the face of the ice cream calling your name from the, free, from the freezer. Now, just yesterday, you were a weakling. You couldn't resist anything, but today is New Year's Day. You are a new person. You are invincible. You check the clock, sure that the day is almost over, when to your dismay, it's only 9.30 a.m., this is bad news, because that green grass smoothie you had for breakfast is gone. And that salad you're planning on having for lunch, that's a joke. You start to feel a little weak physically, you start to feel a little shaky. Your head starts to get that dull headache because it's missing the sugar rush it had from, it's had from banana pudding at homecoming through today. And like a bug drawn to a flame, you find yourself opening the fridge and shoving anything you can get into your face. The more cheese, the better. The more sugar, the better. Oh, well, January 1st is still a holiday, right? January 2nd, you will be invincible. <laughs> I'm judging from the nodding and the laughing that this isn't just my story, and that makes me feel good. My willpower is truly invincible until I become hungry. And then I'm something like the Incredible Hulk. Don't make me hungry. You wouldn't lie to me when I'm hungry. Let's take a, a look at a story in Genesis that, um, that describes two brothers, a story of two brothers, Jacob and Esau. And Esau knows what it's like to truly be hungry. So if you will open your Bibles with me to Genesis 25, we're going to start in verse 19. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, 
daughter of Bethuel the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? What pregnant woman hasn't said that? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? So Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. You know, I feel a little sorry for Esau in the story. If I can't even make it through January 1st, I'm not sure how well I would do if I were famished. Hungry is one thing, but famished is serious. Esau has been out in the field doing whatever it is people did in Bible times out in the field, hunting, I guess. And he has not had trail mix and power bars and the golden arches on every corner to satisfy his hunger. We don't know how long he was out there, but apparently it was a long time. So when Genesis says that Esau is famished, probably means Esau is famished, deeply and extremely hungry. He needs food or he will die. At least that's how it feels to him. So I picture him stumbling weakly in and smelling the food. He's in such a state that he's willing to do whatever it takes to satisfy his hunger. And Jacob picks up on this. The adorable little brother that he is offers him some food in exchange for his birthright. We don't talk much about birthrights in our culture. That's not really a, a term that we use much. But in Esau's time and place, the birthright of the oldest son was a big deal. It guaranteed that when his father died, the firstborn son would become the head of the family. He would receive twice as much as his siblings. He would control the family's wealth. He would be the most powerful figure in the family. This is not something to be taken lightly or to be given up easily. Yet here's Esau, willing to give up his birthright for food, and he doesn't even know what the food is. Let me have some of that red stuff. He's so hungry. He's willing to give up all that matters so that he can eat quickly. This is where the story gets a little hard to swallow for me, pardon the pun. Even if I do feel sorry for Esau, yes, he's famished. He needs food. But surely, he knows he's going to get some. He's made it home. And his brother, yes, is being a brat, but somebody is going to feed this man. The firstborn, Isaac's favorite. Why on earth would he give up all that matters to satisfy a hunger that's going to return a few hours later? We hear him ask, what use is a birthright to me? Makes me wonder if Esau really knows what it is he's giving up. Does he really understand that his birthright means he will be the leader of his family? That he will receive more wealth and power than anybody else around him? Does he understand that part of his, part of his birthright is his father's blessing? A blessing that he literally cries for a few chapters later? Does he get that on top of everything else, his birthright includes the blessing from God that he gave his granddaddy Abraham? A blessing that would not only benefit Esau personally, but would bless the entire world. Does Esau know what we read in verse 28? That he's his father's favorite? His daddy's beloved? Does Esau know who he is? 
Sometimes when I want to understand a story in the Bible better, I try to imagine myself into the story. So I close my eyes and I try to picture the scenery and, and imagine the smells and the sounds. And I try to find the character in the story that I best relate to. And sometimes it's hard. These stories are old and they're from a different culture. But this story, I get it. I get Esau. I wonder if you do too. Maybe you know, like I know, what it's like to be famished. I'm not talking about physical hunger. I don't think many of us know very much about that. I'm talking about a deep longing in our soul. A hunger to be loved and to love. A hunger to be accepted. A hunger to understand life. A hunger to be free of our anxieties and our fears and our failures. A hunger for purpose that comes after we've worked hard all day and then ask what for. A hunger to be good. Good parents, good co-workers, good students. A hunger to be enough. This is a hunger that we know. And it's a hunger that drives us. That wakes us up in the morning and nags at us all day and haunts us in the middle of the night. It's a hunger that makes the quick fixes appealing because we'll do anything to make it go away. Stay in harmful relationships, have just one more drink, cheat on spouses, eat and run and continually keep ourselves distracted with TVs and iPhones and music and busy schedules. We'll do anything to shut up the longing for something more we feel at the core of our being. If you have been raised in church, you've probably heard all your life, Jesus is the answer. God will make a way. And we believe it. We say that we believe it and we want to believe it. And we hope it's true. But when the hunger of human longing hits us in the trenches of life, we hear ourselves asking with Esau, what use is a birthright to me? I'm starving here. When I was in seminary, trying hard to figure out who God was and who I was, a question I often asked was, what difference does it make? To be human is to hunger, physically, spiritually, emotionally. Hunger is strong and powerful, and it often leaves us feeling weak and powerless. So what are we to do? How do we avoid Esau's mistake of giving up our birthright when we too are famished from our lives? Is it even possible to walk away from those quick fixes that promise to satisfy but don't deliver? I say yes. What the story of Esau says to me is that if we really know who we are, what our birthright from God means, then all the things we run to become less appealing. And who are we? We are God's beloved. You are God's beloved. Everything that we hunger for and search for, we already have. We are loved. We are forgiven. We are seen. We are accepted. We are known and we are enough. What use is a birthright to us? What difference does it make? Well, we can bypass that red stuff. All the things that we run to from ice cream to workaholism start to lose their appeal when we know in our gut that we are God's beloved. We don't have to hide who we are because despite the flaws and the failures, we are deeply and forever loved. Nothing satisfies like knowing that. We've all been in Esau's shoes. We've all been caught scarfing down some stew. But thank God our story doesn't have to end like Esau's did. When Esau gave up his birthright, that was it. No going back. But that's not how it is with God's love. We continue to be loved by God, even when we are completely unaware of it. Even when we don't deserve it. Even when we don't choose it. Because it's not about what we do. This is who we are. Children of God. Pay attention to those hunger pangs you feel. It's for more than just a good homecoming dinner. It's a hunger to know God, 
and to know ourselves as God's beloved, and it is who we are. It is our birthright. Thanks be to God. of invitation this morning is hymn number 463 precious lord take my hand please stand with us you heard them this morning. I hope as you go forth from this place, we gather together for fellowship, and as you return to your homes, to the rhythm of life, that you remember, above all else, you are God's beloved. God loves you, just as you are, and that you are, in fact, enough. So may you go forth from this place with God's Holy Spirit leading you. Would you join me as we pray together and are dismissed? Gracious God, we thank you uh, once again for this time to worship. God, we pray your blessings on the food, Lord, that we are about to receive together our time of fellowship.